coming again of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, at which point there will be the resurrection of the dead and the establishment of the new heaven and the new earth. I'm entitled the sermon, A Sure and Certain Hope. You see, Christians are a people of hope. That is, we know that we have a future, a future that is sure. This hope is not a mere wish as the hope of the world and of natural man often is. Our hope is in Yahweh and is specifically in Jesus Christ who is our hope. As I was studying this I came across this verse. I'm sure that I've read it many times in my life, but it never hit me as it did yesterday. It's found in the opening words of Paul <laughs> in his letter to Timothy. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior <laughs> and of Christ Jesus our hope. So Jesus himself is our hope. This is why we have a bright future. Christians are a people who have an optimistic view of the future. Not necessarily of all the events that are occurring on earth, but when we look at those when our mind focuses on these things, we might become even somewhat dejected and a little on the depressed side as nations war against nations and as disease comes and conquers people and we have to battle it ourselves. But the reason Christians are people of hope is because they know that this is not the end, that even beyond all of this, there is a sure and certain future for those who are united to Jesus Christ by faith. And the Apostle presents a message to us in the letter to the Romans. It's guided by an overall theme, and that theme is the righteousness of God. God's rightness. He is the standard of right. God's righteousness. Now, God has a dilemma. You may not think of God as having a dilemma, but it is a dilemma, and we could say of his own making. That is, he created man, and he created man in Adam and Eve in a perfect world, but they were given choice. And they were given a command. That is, first of all, to eat of anything in the garden. It's all your seed. Except there's one tree I don't want you to eat. But you know the story. The tragic story is that through deception of Eve and by willful disobedience of Adam, our parents fell. And in falling, it affected not just them, but all of their posterity, which includes us. All of the genetic line from Adam to the end of humanity. How can God, who created man for his own glory, be righteous in the forgiving of sinners who have willfully disobeyed him? How can God righteously forgive us? There is no way in which we can make up for our transgressions. We are born with a sinful nature, and in our sinful nature we commit acts of transgression. We do them consciously, and we even do them unconsciously. So there is no hope that we can establish our own righteousness, but God has chosen to love, and He has chosen to to make a way for those upon whom he has set his eternal affections. He made the way through the Word, the Word incarnate, 
Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, looking at the advent of the coming of Jesus again in Romans, we need to connect it to the larger context of the epistle, which is found in these three verses. Romans 3, 21-22. Now the righteousness of God has been made manifest. It's been made known. It's been shown. Apart from the law, although the law and the prophets testify or bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. If we are to enjoy the presence of God, for all eternity, we must have God's righteousness. We cannot earn it. It can be granted to us as a gift, but only because it is a righteousness that has been achieved by our representative, Jesus, the second act. A righteousness of God through faith in Jesus the Messiah for all who believe. Now we connect that then with Romans chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. Speaking about Abraham and the lessons that we draw from his life, the words, it was counted to him, that's Genesis 15, were not written for his sake alone, that is only for Abraham, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in Him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, that's through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace, this favor, of God in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's the Christian's hope. Can you say those words with me? We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now this is testified to us at the very beginning of our Christian lives in the rite of initiation into the Christian faith of baptism, which testifies of our union with Jesus Christ. Because all that we have as believers comes from our union with Jesus Christ. It's in Him we find all that we need to be God's people. He is our righteousness and our sanctification. He is our wisdom. He is our glorification. He is our joy. And He is our Baptism via immersion. A ceremony of burial and what? Resurrection. And the words are even used. We are buried with Him and raised with Him. Romans 6, 5. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. What kind of resurrection was his? Well, that's one of the questions we have to ask and answer. Was it simply some kind of spiritual resurrection where, you know, his ideas survive? His ideas, his thought life, or whatever? No, it was a physical, flesh and bone resurrection in which he could sit down at table with his disciples and eat broiled fish. A body in which he could catch fish and prepare them on the seashore for his disciples to consume. It was a body of flesh and bone that he could invite his disciples to say, touch me and see that it is me that's the resurrection of our Lord. It's a real resurrection of a real body and bone, but a body and bone that's now been raised immortal. 
glorified, no longer subject to disease or sickness or death, given powers that we would say are supernatural, to nevertheless a physical human body, just like God's. Except ours at this stage is what? Mortal, corruptible, subject to sickness and death. So Romans 6, 5 testifies that we shall see, certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. It's for these reasons that Christians are a people of hope. Now let me define the terms for you. There are certain terms that we need to understand as we go through this today. And the first term is hope. What is hope? So I'm using hope in the New Testament sense, or even in the First Testament sense, it's a confident expectation of a future event based on God's promises and on God's actions of the past. Especially in the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. So it's a confident expectation of a sure future based on the very integrity of God's person and His promises, which He has demonstrated in the past, in the history of Israel when He delivered them from Egyptian bondage, and in the history of mankind when He sent His Son, Jesus of Nazareth, the Word made flesh, who in his own body endured the curse, experienced our death, and was raised triumphant over it all. We have a hope, a confident expectation, that the outcome for us, because you're not, we are united with him, will be the same as his. Amen. Now this brings us to our guiding question of the passage before us, which is found in Romans chapter 7 and verse 24. Here's the question that Paul asked. It comes from his own experience. Who will deliver me from this body of death? In the Greek word is the word soma. Now often we use the word flesh to refer to our nature. But soma refers not to our human nature as we speak of it, but to our human bodies. It's referring to the body in which you are, in which you, you are, your body, your mind, your soul, and spirit. You're a whole people currently corrupted and subject to death, but your destiny is also to be whole people, but those redeemed in Christ will be whole in glorified bodies, made like unto his own glorious body. So the question is, who will separate me from this body of death? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Not separate me. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And the answer, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the answer. Amen. All right. The result is found in Romans, what we call Romans 8.1, which is such a continuation of Paul's writing. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation, no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, what is he talking about? What is this condemnation, this judgment? Some people totally misuse the scripture, so they'll do something quite evil or bad, and then they'll say to you, well, you can't judge me. <laughs> That's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about the eternal judgment before God's right throne, in which you could be subject to be cast into the eternal flames of hell. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about whether you feel guilty or don't feel guilty or someone else thinks you're guilty. 
It's talking about God's judgment of you. God's condemnation of you as a sinner with unforgiven sins in rebellion against Him. Those who are in Christ Jesus, for them, and only them, there is no judgment to come. No condemnation. Now why is that? Well, because the judgment is past. The judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus occurred outside of Jerusalem on a cross in which Jesus of Nazareth was nailed. It wasn't just his physical body that was suffering. His very person in all of his dimension was enduring the punishment, the condemnation, and the judgment that was against us. He paid for our sins so that God could be just and righteous in forgiving us of our sins. Because we are in Christ Jesus, the judgment is past. There's a story. No, no stories are perfect that we can try to tell to illustrate. If I can remember this. Uh, you know there's fires that sometimes occur in the United States, uh, in Texas, but primarily in the California, Colorado, in the summertime, right? Huge forest fires. But you, you know one of the major ways of fighting against a forest fire, damaging your home or your business, is that you, you hear that these fires are coming, so you go and you set the things around your place on fire. You burn it up to a certain degree out so that when the flames come from this burning forest, it's already burnt. And because it's already burnt, you're protected in it. The flames do not reach you because you're in a burned out section. Now that's an imperfect kind of illustration, but because the fire of God's judgment has already been burned Amen. in Christ Jesus, and you're in Him, the judgment is past. The judgment to come will not cast the Christian into hell. Amen. We have a sure and certain hope. Well, what is that sure and certain hope? I want to define it for you. My definition is imperfect. <laughs> but it's this. Our sure and certain hope is the hope of eternal life in resurrected bodies with Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ, on the renewed new earth, cleansed of all the results of the fall. I'll repeat that. Our sure and certain hope is that of eternal life in resurrected bodies. That doesn't just mean a body. Body, soul, mind, and spirit with Jesus Christ on the renew, that is the new earth that's been cleansed of all the results of the fall. In other words, Glorification awaits us when Jesus returns to earth. That's the reason we pray, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. All right, we connected with the past. We're looking at the future, and we understand what our hope is. Here's the question that I want us to answer from the Word of God today. Why is this our assured future? Why do we have 
a sure and certain hope. What is the basis of this sure and certain hope of the Christian? Well, you know the first answer because I just gave it to you in our illustration. We have a sure and certain hope because our judgment for our sins is past and was endured by Christ Jesus on our behalf. Therefore, there is no condemnation for us. So we turn now to the text before us. and You can look at the passage that was passed out to you, or you can simply look in your Bible as we go along. Okay? So we go back. Romans 7, 24. Wretched man that I am. Well, Paul's speaking, but I could say that. Wretched man that I am. Who can deliver me from this body of death? Right now, I, I have a body that is subject to death. It's subject to a lot of things, and you already see the results of it. All right? Many of them. And there's more to come unless Jesus comes back quickly and makes a change. Okay? But whether he does or not, it's not in my ability to understand or to bring to pass. But I know that after all of this, I have a future. Who will deliver me from this body of death? The answer is, Jesus Christ my Lord. Because of this, I serve the law of God in my mind, but with my current flesh, I still serve the law of sin. The law of sin is what? Death. But there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is your inevitable death, your inevitable hell, unless you are delivered by God from it. But we're delivered by God through Jesus Christ in our union with Him. Now Paul gives us so very good reasons why we can have this hope. So as you look at the text in front of you, I want to set before you a number of reasons why we have this sure and certain hope. Right? First of all, we have a sure and certain hope because the spirit of life has freed us in union with Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. What's he talking about? He's talking about regeneration. He's talking about that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the one who raised Jesus from the dead, the one who hovered over the face of the waters of the creation, is the one who hovered over our souls and spirits. In God, the Holy Spirit caused us to be born again. He moved our wills, our minds, our hearts. He quickened us. He gave life so that we could respond in repentance and faith to Christ our Lord. This Spirit unites us to Christ Himself. Because Christ is no longer subject to the law of sin and death. That's what He was subject to on the cross. In the resurrection, He's no longer subject to that, right? He's raised immortal. We have been raised with Him. We have a certain hope because the Spirit of life is freed us in union with Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We have a sure and certain hope because we have the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwelling in us and He will give life to our mortal bodies. We have the indwelling Christ with the Holy Spirit inside of our mortal bodies. 
both corporately as the body of Christ and individually as members of the body of Christ. Listen to the word. Romans 8, 10. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. What is the righteousness of Christ? Although the body is dead, that means our bodies are subject to this. We have the principle of death within us unless there is deliverance by the resurrection of the dead or translation beforehand, we will physically die. But, the spirit of life is in us. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Because this spirit who lives within us, Paul says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Through the Spirit who dwells in you. You know, there's some who want to take this passage and say, well, you see, because the Holy Spirit's living in you, can just say, well, you're not sick and you'll be well. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the, the future state. He's talking about what's going to happen at the end. The Holy Spirit who dwells within us will give life to our mortal bodies. He lives in us. He's the life of God. Paul continues around verse 15. We have a sure and certain future because we are the adopted sons of God, co-heirs with Christ to inherit the earth. You know the promise of land that God gave to Abraham if you read it carefully, both in the First Testament and in the New, is not simply talking about what we call Palestine. It says the earth. It says that Abraham will be a blessing for all nations. Ultimately, the promise of the land is the promise of the new earth. The whole earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters do cover the sea. We, as the adopted sons of God, are co-heirs with Christ to inherit the entire world. This is what it says. Listen to Paul. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we're children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. The Christian is actually promised suffering this side of glory. But he is also promised glory at the end. We get some glory now, but it's transitory, isn't it? We feel it, we understand it, we experience it, but, but also there's suffering mingles with it. It's the light of life. But we have the spirit of adoption. But see, the Holy Spirit. You know, this is... The true, a true test of the Christian. You can go through general gymnastics and you can pronounce people the Christians based on general gymnastics. You, I, I tell you this story about Christ. Do you believe that story is true? Okay. If you believe that story is true, okay, now you're a Christian. Now you have eternal life. That's not true. It's not by formula. It's not by some rote statement or through logic. It's through the Spirit of God Himself regenerating us and bringing us into union with Jesus Christ. And that Spirit testifies to us that we are children of God. I believe in the promises of God. 
And I'm certain because God's promises are true. But I also have the witness of the Spirit within me. And if you don't have the witness of the Spirit within you, then you should seek God for Him to grant that to you. The assurance, the full assurance of faith, it's called. The Holy Spirit testifying to your spirit within that says you're a child of God and that you come to these words automatically. You can just say them. You feel them. You utter them, Father, Father God. It's even manifested in our prayer life. We turn to God as Father and speak to Him from the depths of our heart. Now we are adopted as sons. It doesn't say sons and daughters. We want to be, you know, say, oh, that's not, it says sons, and why? Because it's the sons, especially the firstborn sons, that inherited. Well, who is the firstborn son? But Jesus is. That's why we're called a co-heir with him. So we are involved in his sonship. That's why we are the adopted sons of God. Okay. Now, Paul comes to this great climax. What all does this involve? It's not just us being resurrected from the dead. But it is the earth being released from its bondage. Look at these verses. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now if you compare them to other people's sufferings or to your experience, you, you can do that. But if you look at it, the future, the future glory that's to come, then you can get things in perspective. For the creation, the creation, that's what we call old Mother Earth, okay? Planet Earth. This place that God created for mankind to live on. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Paul is Apromorphizing the, the earth itself. It's like the earth is a living being saying, oh, help me. Get me out of this bondage. Get me out of this decay. Get me out of this corruption. It longs, it waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Why? For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope. For the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth and now. Not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly is we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we are saved. And you understand that the New Testament uses this concept of the adoption in two ways. There is the immediate adoption through faith in Christ. God adopts us as sons, sons and daughters, okay? His children. But there is the adoption of the full person to come. For the full person includes a restoration of mankind to his original state plus. The redemption of Christ is not only the reversal of the fall, but it's a reversal and a superabundance added to it. In other words, the renewed earth and the resurrected human will be in a far better and glorious state than Adam ever enjoyed in the garden. And we will be in a state in which there is no longer any possibility of sin, any possibility of a loss of what God has restored. So, we are part of God's creation. And it's because of our sin 
that the earth, the environment, the animal kingdom, and all it was subjected to the violence that marks the wild, that marks humanity. There's coming a day when the lion shall lay down with its predatory. There'll be no longer the eating, consuming of one to another. There will be perfect peace and harmony. You find it spelled out for you in the prophet Isaiah, I think in chapter 11 and chapter 35. The new heaven, the new earth, with the new humanity. And Paul goes on. Why do we have a sure and certain hope? Well, we have a sure and certain future because we are predestined to glory. We have a sure and certain hope because God has predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son and He has predestined us to glory. Now what then do we mean by predestination? Let me give you a little off the cuff. Definition, okay? It's important that we understand definition. Predestination. To predestine something means that something is beforehand predetermined. In other words, the outcome is already known. And the outcome will surely come to pass. Why? Because it's based on the wisdom and the purpose of God and is made sure by His omnipotent, sovereign power. Predestination is a comfort to Christians. Predestination means there is no possibility that once you're in Christ, you can ever be lost. Why? Because the punishment due to you has been removed through Christ Himself who endured it. And the life of Christ has been granted to you in the first fruits of the earnest of the Holy Spirit. And the fullness will come in your resurrection from the dead when you as a whole person, body, mind, soul, and spirit, will be made conformable to the very image of Christ in holiness, in perfection, humanity as God created us to be. So we have a sure and certain future because we are predestined to glory. Here's what he says. Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God all things work together for good. He didn't say for everybody, did he? It says, for those who love God, all things work together for good. This is not a scripture we can just quote willy-nilly to just anybody, whatever the circumstances in life. That's not the context. The context is the people of God who have faith in Jesus Christ. It's those for whom these words are true. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also raised. Okay? He also called. I'm sorry. Those He predestined, He also called. That means that God in His election has chosen people to be His own. In the course of time, the gospel comes to them and they hear it. And you don't just hear it with your external ears, but this calling means you hear it with your internal ears. And when you hear it with your internal ears, you believe it. You grasp it. You grasp it. And when you do, those whom he called, he also justified. Now Paul deals a lot with sanctification in the book of Romans. But here, he jumps from justification all the way to glorification. And he uses the past tense with each one of these words. 
That means it's a completed action. It means that it's so sure that it can never fail not to happen. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. In other words, my future as a child of God on a new earth in heaven, in resurrected bodies, is certain as if it had already occurred. So what is glorification? Well, I wrote this out today. I read a lot of people, but, you know, I don't have time to quote them, so I just wrote this out. Glorification is the ultimate state of the redeemed, justified, and saved person in which the results of the fall are completely reversed. And man, that is human, redeemed human, are brought to ultimate holiness in body and soul and spirit. We are predestined to be holy. As holy as Christ. And God is working that in us. God will bring it to pass the last when He glorifies us in the resurrection from the dead. It is all because of our union with Jesus Christ. Listen to Hebrews 2.10. For we see Him, that we see Jesus who for a little while was made lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And that everyone is everyone who is in him by faith. Hebrews 2.10 For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. And this from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 to 20. By two unchangeable things, and which is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. For Jesus is gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see, the process of living as a Christian, from the point of justification to the point of glorification, is sometimes a struggle, isn't it? It involves two steps forward, step back, or the opposite. It involves the struggle of Christian growth and sanctification, the sufferings of this world, the things that we go through that mature us as believers. But the outcome is certain because Christ has already entered into heaven he is our great high priest and he intercedes for us and his blood goes on cleansing us from our sins. So we've looked at the word hope, at the word predestination, at the word glorification, and at the word resurrection. Listen to Job. The skin worms were destroying his body. I don't know what they were. Probably some kind of skin cancer. Eating them alive. But as for me, he says, I know that my Redeemer, my Vindicator, is alive. And he, the last one, will take his stand on the soil. Even after my skin has been destroyed, clothed in my flesh, I will see God. That's a different translation. But it's, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the end, in my own flesh, in which the skin worms have destroyed it, I shall in my body behold my Redeemer. That's the hope of resurrection. In my flesh, I will see God. Resurrection is a rising again. 
is a return to life after having died, but not return to life in a mortal body. It's not resuscitation where you're subject again to sickness or death. It's raised immortal. Bodies no longer subject to corruption. No longer subject to death. Bodies fit for eternal habitation in the new heaven and the new earth. So when we talk about a return to life after having died, it mainly refers to the resurrection of Christ, which is the central event of the Christian faith. But it also refers to the Christian doctrine of corporate resurrection, which is connected to the judgment of both the living and the dead. And it's true for us because we are united with Christ in His death, His burial, His resurrection, even His ascension. Listen to Paul, Philippians 3, 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, a deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body, the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Here the Apostle John, as he writes in 1 John 3, Beloved, we're God's children now, but what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. These are the reasons why we have a sure and certain hope. Why Christians are a people of confident faith of expectation and hope, who join in the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who cry out with the Apostle John at the end of Revelation, even so come, Lord Jesus. The early Christians had a, a catchword, a watchword for it. Maranatha. Maranatha. Now, that's an interesting word because it can be present and future. It means both. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Come in our midst. Come now among us as we worship you, as we live for you, as we pray. But come, Lord Jesus. Come in all your glory. Come in all the power of your redeemed, resurrected body. Come. Come. Bring us to yourself. Gather us around you. Establish your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Our deliverance from sin and the fall would not be complete apart from the resurrection of the body. Man was created body, mind, soul, and spirit. He is redeemed body, mind, soul, and spirit. This is why Paul says that if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you have no hope. And if you deny that Christ is raised from the dead, then what happened? What do you have? But because Christ is resurrected from the dead, those who believe in Him, those who are united to Him, have a sure and certain future. We've looked at the future with confident expectation for the Christian. For those who are in Christ Jesus through a living faith, born of the Holy Spirit's work. But what about you personally? Do you have this confidence? Are you living in this expectation? Are you now living in this interim period with the hope grounded in Jesus' own resurrection from the dead? Do you have the witness of the Spirit within that testifies to you that you are a son, a child of God. Such confidence empowers our prayers, encourages our wills, and warms our affections. If you believe in the resurrected, glorified Jesus, Son of God, you have a sure and certain 
3. Amen. 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 Amen.